Patia stage, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Andrew Ams, co-founder of the Spring Project, who is going to talk to us about the technology of body and mind. Please welcome Andrew on stage. Good afternoon, Friday afternoon, the last day of campus party. It's good to see your faces. Just a little point of detail. In the agenda online, I think it said I'm going to talk about the technology of baby in mind, which is quite an interesting typo. Uh, I'll try and make the connection to baby in mind, but my intention is to talk about the technology of body and mind. Uh, my name is Andrew Arms, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Spring Project. So I'm just going to start with a little bit about my background and my journey to get here, um, because it'll add you know, a little bit of context as to why the Spring Project exists. Then I'm going to talk about what the Spring Project is all about. I'm going to mention this equation, this source code, as we call it, the human source code. And then I'm really going to invite questions, because we've been talking about this all week, different speaker sessions, workshops. Some of you may have been to them. Some of you may have missed them. Yeah, this may be the first time that you're coming to it. But I'm getting a little bit tired of the sound of my own voice. And if something I know, in order to be brilliant, is to look after yourself. And so I'm going to encourage you to support me to look after myself, to be brilliant. And I'm going to do that by encouraging you to ask questions and get involved as well. So I'm going to do a little bit of talking, and then I'm going to you know, take questions and see where we go with that. And just for your, uh, again, so, uh, you know, for your interest, we've also got one of the other co-founders of the Spring Project, Dennis, down here. If you want to, yeah, come and, come and join us. Yep, Dennis on the stage. And another one who's taking photos up here is Darius. So the three founders, they've literally just descended upon us. So, okay, l let, me, let me do the kind of who am I, what, you know, why am I involved in this, a little bit of the background. So, when I, when I kind of uh, got to 18, in the UK you have to kind of choose what A-levels you're going to do. And I really didn't know what it was I wanted to do with my life, and I felt, wow, you know, everybody was telling me I now needed to decide which three or four subjects 
that were going to inform the rest of my kind of career, my life, I had to do. And I really, you know, I was, I was pretty average at everything. You know, and I was like, what, what am I going to do? There were some things I was really keen on, things like drama and singing. And at the time, you know, that was never going to happen in my, my household. I was never going to be able to do an A-level in singing. Yeah, my dad was not going to let it happen. So I had to make these choices, and I, I really didn't know, so I, I, I made some choices that I would take. I was good at what they, you know, kind of okay at what they were doing, and I got through my A-levels. And then at the end of the A-levels, it's like I then had to decide what degree I was going to do. My parents were adamant that I was going to go to university. I was like, can't I just drop out? I don't know what I want to do. Can't I just go and, you know, find something in life that's going to, you know, make, you know, be my passion? It's like, no, you're going to go to university. I, I, I was brave enough actually to tell my dad I wanted to take a year out first. So I did actually manage to take a year out. And, and during that year, it was really just a, a search for trying to find some sense of what is it I'm going to do with my life? I was kind of walking around going, what is going to bring some meaning? You know, I've, ch I've done these A-levels. They don't seem to make much sense to me uh, you know, about what I wanted to do. But anyway, at the end of, well, halfway through the year, I then had to kind of apply to university. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what I want to do. And, and I remember having a conversation with somebody who'd, who was like, why don't you do psychology? It's like, because that, that's all about understanding people and why they do things. So it was like... Okay, I hadn't done any psychology in my A-levels. It was like, I had no kind of like knowledge or background or technical training in it. But I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do psychology because at least it gave me a little bit of, well, if I can understand how anybody makes any choices, I might be able to work myself out. It was like, work that out, work, work, work myself out, I might be able to help other people. So I went off to university, I did psychology. It was okay, and I didn't, but I didn't, if, if you've ever done any psychology at university, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but... You know, psychology is a, a, you know, it's a very technical subject, right? It's not about human behavior necessarily. It's about statistics and, and experiments. And, and that really wasn't, you know, interesting to me. It was, I was more interested in the, you know, why do people choose to do what they do? And you have to do, actually, at university, quite a lot of technical stuff before you even get to select that kind of, in your third year, you might be lucky to choose to do something that might be about behavior. But anyway, so I completed my degree. I was like, well... I still didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So it's like, they were then, well, you need to get a job now. I was like, oh my goodness. Um, so I, I was like, so I've, I've got this degree. I was like, I'm really not ready. I don't know what job I'm going to do. So I'm, I'm going to stay in education. It was like another avoidance. It was like, before I end up getting into a career, I'm going to do another year. So it's like, I searched around and I looked for anybody that would take me with my 2-1 in psychology. And it was the same university. I think they only accepted me because I'd gone, I'd gone to the university and the business school said, yeah, okay, you can come here. You got a 2-1 in a, in, a, in a degree from our university, so we'll accept you. And, and the only course they'd accept me onto was management science and operational research. It was like, oh my goodness, yeah. I was, I was interested in behavior and I was going to do something in maths. And, and, and don't get me wrong, Lots of math, you know, great, you know, maths is everywhere. Don't get me wrong, I totally recognize that maths, if you understand maths, you can understand the world. But for, for me at the time, I didn't, just didn't get that. I was like, it was all about behavior. But anyway, it was the only course I could get accepted onto. So I was like, okay, right, I'll do another year of this. And that was awful. It was like 40 hours of, you know, I, I went from a psychology degree, which was like, you do six hours a week, right, of lectures. And then the rest is supposed to be self-learning, and I wasn't particularly good at that because I didn't know what I wanted to do, right? So I was like, what am I going to do with my spare time? So I took up a sport because that was like, well, that was kind of interesting. I got to meet lots of people and do something. So then I was in tonight 40 hours of lectures of something I really didn't want to do. But it was like, I managed to you know, get through that kind of course and just about passed. I think I got a condoned pass, whatever they, whatever they call them. It was like, I remember listen, I was listening to the keynote at lunchtime and he was like 271st fir out of 271, if you saw it. I, that was the same for me in that year. It was like, you, we don't want to fail you. You know, we're, we're scraping around for marks. You know, you're a nice guy, so we'll give you an extra mark so you can pass, right? So, and, and then I really was, my dad was like out of money. It was like, you're not going to, you know, back in those days, you know, they had to pay for this stuff, right? Or, you know, I, I couldn't get a student loan that would cover it. It was like, You've either got to work to cover your education. There was, no, there was no way of doing it for free, right? So he was like, no way, get a job. So I was like, well, what, you know, what do I do? So then it was simply looking around, and I had psychology and maths, this master's. And it was like, OK, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get whatever job I can get that, that that's acceptable. 
It was like they need those. It wasn't like, oh, I'll, I'll get the dream job because, you know, that's what I want to do. So I ended up, I fell kind of into a little bit of a management consultancy rotational program in a large organization, in a retail organization. I, had, I, I went in and I was on this program that was like, come and look at our business, you use your maths and understanding of psychology to help our, mass, uh, you know, our business be better. And then ultimately fell into HR, human resources. And, and, I, and I, I essentially grew a career from there. I was like really rudderless, but it was like I was kind of good at this, it had a little bit of human kind of interest. It was like, why do people come to work? I got a little bit more specialized, and I realized as I got a bit more specialized that actually, now I started to get interested in what I was doing. It was like, as I specialized, I was like, why do people turn up to work? I suddenly started to get responsibility for recruiting people and for developing them in the organization. I kind of stumbled into this. And then I was like, wow, okay, now this is getting kind of interesting. It's like, why do people turn up for work? I, I spent my whole time like, unsure about what it is I wanted to do, no support in terms of working out what it was I wanted to do with my life, and kind of stumbled into ultimately what I wanted to do. So some, somewhere out there, somebody was looking after me, because I, or, or maybe just the fact that I wanted to be, you know, be looking at why people made, made decisions. That was actually choose, making me choose things that subconsciously were help, was helping me along. But anyway, I, I, cut a long story short now, birth of my son, 10 years later, I'm at the top of the organization from an HR perspective. CEOs were asking me, make people love their job. People that turn up into this organization, I want them to love their job. When they walk through the door, I want them to feel like this is the only place on earth that they would want to be. That's what they were asking me to do. Create an organization where everybody turns up and it's like, I cannot believe I'm at work today, right? And I realized I was, I was in the way. It was like, because I just didn't feel like that. Although I kind of liked my job, it was like, I, didn't, I couldn't deliver it. I wasn't an expression of what I was being asked to do. It was like, how do you expect me to help people love what they do when I don't love it myself? It was like, I might have been a little bit close, something might have been looking after me, but really, I was a problem. It was like, I wanted it, but I didn't know how to get it. And and I thought, well, I'll move to another organization, and that might be different. So I went to another organization, same kind of challenge. Thought, you know, th and I jumped around jobs a little bit, because I thought, I'm unhappy. If I go somewhere else, then that'll make me happy. Change is as good as a break, they sometimes say. But it really wasn't working for me. And so the birth of my son comes around, and I literally in the, in the, in the kind of, what I call it, maternity ward. I'm holding my son, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is the only thing that I really know to be true in my life. Uh, you know, everything else is just based on other people's ideas, like, you know, what, I should be, what they've been telling me to do with my life. Do these A-levels, do this degree, you know, get a job. And, I, and I, you know, I realized I hadn't had an independent thought or made a really strong choice for myself all the way along. And when I was holding my son in, his, in my hands, I was like, so if this is the only thing I really know to be true, that I, you know, I'm now a father and I need to look after this, what is it that I want for him? What does this, what does this mean for me? And I was looking and I was like, I want him to be free. It was like, I want him to be able to be free to choose for himself what it is he wants to do with his life. And, and through a process of, I don't know, pain, suffering, reflection, whatever it was, it was like, to give him the best chance to be free, this is how I rationalized it in my mind, to give him the best chance to have a free life, to go through it, loving what he does, I needed to be free. It was like, there are going to be many people in his life they're going to tell him what to do. Many people with their anxieties, their neurosis, their, the media telling him what to do, you know, teachers, everybody telling him this is what he should do with his life. I didn't want to be one of them. I was like, you do what you want, right? Be free. And in that moment of choice, it was like, I need to be free. That was, that was everything for me. It was like, suddenly I could see the path to kind of living without fear for myself. And in that moment, I suddenly then realized exactly what the organizations were asking me to do. It's like they're asking me to design programs to recruit people into those organizations and to develop freedom in people, to give them liberation from fear. It's like, don't recruit people that are joining your organization that are joining for all the wrong reasons. You know, that, oh, it's going to pay the check. You know, I'm going to be able to pay them more. If they don't love what they do, you know, aren't free, 
It's like that was going to cause a problem in the long run. It was unsustainable for the organization and for the individuals. So in that moment, I could see it really clearly, but I had to change my life entirely. And then I'm going to fast forward a few years and spend a lot of time kind of in the wilderness, you know, working out what it is I wanted to do with my life. And I met some wonderful people along the way. And I, lucky enough, because I was in HR, I'd met people really at the top of their game from a personal development perspective. And Dennis is one of those people, as is Darius, who's now disappeared. Darius, are you still here? No, De so Dennis, Dennis is, a, I'm, I'm going to say, he has a master in, his, in many things, but particularly in his chosen field as well. And maybe Dennis will talk about that if we get the right question and, and what have you. And, and so, I, you know, I kind of, I was like, what is the work I want to do? And I was fortunate enough to sit down with people that were masters in their field, you know, that were maybe also, you know, thinking about what it is they wanted to do or were clear about what it is they wanted to do. And we came together, essentially. It was a long story, but we came together and we spoke for about two years. It was like we wanted to get really clear about what is the work we want to do. And after two years of, uh, we used to call it sitting around the fire, right? And the fire was this process of burning away everything that was untrue about ourselves. This, is, this was our analogy. It was like when we came together and we sat around this fire, it was like when we sit by the fire, you know, if you imagine the analogy, when you st step into a fire, you, you burn away everything that you're not. You're only left with what's true, right? So this was, this was our analogy. It's like when we came together, we were only ever going to speak accurately of the truth, who we were. And that process really supported this process of liberation for myself. And and at the end of this two years, and it's an ongoing discussion, we've been working now together for five years on the Spring Project, we came up with the Spring Project. And the work that we want to do is to support people to be free, to be liberated from the things that hold them back. And one way that you can articulate that is to help people to be brilliant. When people are free, understand who they are, understand the contribution they have to give to the world, and are not inhibited to bring that contribution to the world, they're brilliant. And through working with thousands of people over five years, and working on ourselves actually, probably more so than the thousands of people we've been working with, understanding that brilliance also has other byproducts. And the other by byproducts are, it leads to a, a kinder and more sustainable world. When people are being brilliant, and we'll talk about a little bit about the, the source code in a moment, but when people are being brilliant, they live sustainably in their lives. And if they're living sustainably in their lives, we have found that they make more sustainable choices and decisions and are conscious of the impact of the choices and decisions they make on the world around them. They become very connected to the world around them because they don't want to damage that world in any way so that it becomes unsustainable for them to live in that world. So we talk about sustainability. Brilliance, as much as it you know, is about bringing your contribution, it's doing it in a way that is sustainable. Because many people, when they're free, they can get caught in this trap of, oh, I must, I must you know, bring my brilliance. And sometimes they diminish themselves because they're giving their brilliance so much that they actually don't take care of themselves. To come full circle to my very, very first point about speaking too much today, it would be unwise of me for my voice to get you know, because then I'm not going to be able to speak for a week, and that's not taking care of myself. And, you know, that to me would be unsustainable behavior. So I need to be conscious of the choices I'm making and looking after myself. Sustainable behavior, su sustainable choices. And so the Spring Project, and I'm going to get to the, the source code in a moment, has spent five years working with thousands of people, working with many organizations, working with Telefonica. You know, a lot of the team that you see walking around here have been recruited with brilliance in mind, is you know, making sure that the people that are joining this organization to put on events like this are doing it from a, a position of sustainability. They love what they do. They want to make this event as amazing as possible for you. So, so we're working with organizations like Telefonica. And, and what we've realized is you can distill brilliance down into what we are calling for this week the human source code. And by developing these certain characteristics leads to people unlocking their brilliance. And the equation, as you can see, is there, is integrity plus responsibility 
multiplied by curiosity. And for those of you that have been here all week, we've been running a whole series of workshops and speaking sessions and work in bar camp, seminars, looking at each of those elements in various levels of depth. So I know that a couple of people have just come along from the integrity workshop that we were just working on. So one last thing I want to talk about, and then I'm going to kind of take some questions, or we're going to take some questions, is we came up with one other kind of context in which people could understand what we were talking about. And, and that context is the only work we want to do is, is work where we are taken care of, so we win. The people that we are working with also win. And importantly, the wider world wins. So as much as we came up with the source code, a, a larger context around it was we are only going to engage in work where we are OK, taken care of. Whoever we might be working with, an organization, an individual, a client, whatever it might be, they are also taken care of. But what we create together also considers the wider world. And by having that context around the decisions that we make allows us really to see clearly whether the choices are sustainable or not for ourselves, for our clients, or for the wider world. And if in any decision that we're making or relationship that we have where one of those wins is not evident, is not clear, we don't act. It's like that is not work we want to do. So we're very specific about the work we want to do. It must meet that criteria. So long story short, there is no place in the world right now that I would rather be than standing here on this stage talking to you. And what we want for the Spring Project and for everybody in this room and for everything that Campus Party stands for is for you to feel like that as well. And there is a, a process that can support the acceleration, if you're not in that space already, to get there. And that's what we call the human source code. Is there anything you would like to add that I may have missed? So, so that's, I don't, I don't know, that's 20 minutes of me talking about the Spring Project, what we've been doing here, the source code. I would love to take any questions that you have. And, and they can be about anything. They, they, they can be about my son, if you like. I'm happy to talk about my children until I'm blue in the face. So, so anything you would like to ask? Yeah, can we? Yeah. we we've got a Ksenia here, has a roving mic. And, and I just want to point out, just before you ask your question, here's an example of brilliance. So I turned up with a laptop five minutes to go before the presentation, right? And I said to Dan, who's up here, waving, up there, I said, Dan, could you just get it so that my video plays? And then at the end of the video, we get this thing back up. He's like looking at me, he's like, five minutes to go, right? And you want me to pull this off? And literally, in five minutes, he has created that presentation. And to me, that's like brilliance. I don't, I don't know whether you love your job, Dan, but trust me, that was brilliance in action. So thank you. I just wanted to recognize that. And, and to the rest of the team that's supporting this brilliant work. Sorry, your question. Hi. I think what you're saying is really interesting, but it seems it's a little bit the holy grail because if everybody was brilliant, then they'd be really passionate and enthused about what they're doing. They'd be happy that it's Monday. And I think part of brilliance is being able to make the right choices and being informed. And I think the world we live in doesn't necessarily facilitate that. You kind of just have to carry on within this. And it's a little bit like a hamster wheel. Um, I have to do this job because I have to pay the bills. And very often you don't have that time where you can step back and go, actually, these are my gifts, these are my talents. The more effective I am at that, the more effective my employer, the more effective my world. Um, so where's the starting point in terms of what you were talking about? Um, and in terms of springboard, who's that targeted at? Businesses or earlier stage in life when you are making those formulative decisions? Do you want, do you want to go? Or? OK. Um, big, big, yeah, mate, it's, yeah, I, I'm going to. Yeah, so the question, if you didn't quite hear it, was it, it sounded like you were saying, oh, it's easy to say, holy grail. We're, we're all in this. Pro we're in the system. How do we kind of, how can we offer a process by which to be in the system but still move towards what it is we want to be brilliant at? Was that, was, is that a kind of fair? 
Yeah? Go on, if I missed it, is that, is that enough? OK. Um, yeah, so, so that you don't all have to go, right, my career's over. I, you know, I, I've been pretending all my life. I'm now holding my child in my hands. I need to be free. It's like, yeah, that, I mean, that's precisely what we hope to create with the Spring Project, is there is a method and a process by which to navigate from where you are to where you want to be without all the pain and the suffering that us as co-founders may have been, gone through. And at the same time, the Spring Project is very much an experiment in itself, is we are looking at doing things very differently. We are creating a new way of working and seeing what happens when we do precisely that and we work with people in precisely that way. So one of the byproducts that we're finding of working in this way with this technology of body and mind is a great deal of abundance gets unlocked. And creating a system that harnesses that abundance that essentially becomes a new, a new economy, a new way of doing things, a new way of thinking about it. So we're, as, as much as we want people to be brilliant, we're also recognizing that at, at some level, this is work that has never been done before, never been done before, as far as we can tell. There may, it may be in little pockets, or it may be looking like something else, but we're being very clear about the idea that if you unlock brilliance in people, yeah, it creates a better world, a kinder world. So, so, that, so we're also exper experimenting a little bit with, with what the byproducts are of how we're doing it. And, and so, the, sorry, do you want to step in? So, so a couple of other, we're very experiential in what we do. If you've just come from the integrity workshop, you'll probably know this, is many people think they have a situation. It's like, I'm, I can't navigate from where I am to, to the new position. And what we offer are a series of practices, real base, evidence-based practices that people can get the feedback, practice new ways of being in order to make that navigation. And what we, we, we like to encourage is that it's not, you know, most people get this intellectually. It's like, yeah, well, of course, everybody wants to be brilliant. But we are very action-orientated. And it's to provide people with the practices, yeah, rather than us going, you must do it this way. It's like, you practice, you get the feedback. You work out how it's going to support you to move to your new brilliant, you know, wherever you want to be. So it's, very, it's not descriptive about how you're going to do it. And through the practice, people learn and grow. And they, and, and, and they work out how they're going to navigate from where they are to their brilliance. Do you want to add anything? Um, Is it on? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I sense a little in your question as well the, the, the idea of, look, this is the way the world works. Um, you're talking about something that's not a practical reality right now. Um, and if we look at some of the big sh shifts and changes in, in the way the world works, um, when, when stuff's not working right, you can protest, you can fight it, um, you can spend a lot of time saying, uh, I don't like this globalization, I don't like this and that and the other, and that's a good thing to do, it's an important thing to do. Um, but quite often, if, when we start, start trying to figure out a solution to something, uh, we can also stand up, and it may look like that's what we're doing, standing up and saying, uh, you don't want to do it like that, you want to do it like that. Because uh, it looks to me like you've got it wrong. Um, so to us, uh, the best way to introduce a change is to create an alternative and make it work. Uh, when you create an alternative and make it work, um, for instance, in my, my background, I do a lot of training with people, like, for instance, sports people or in different ways. If you come up to someone and say, you don't want to do it like that, you want to do it like that, they'll say, well, what do you know? And, um, you know, show me, how should I do it? If you don't have something to give them to replace what you're taking away, um, they'd, they'd be quite right in saying, go away. <laughs> So uh, the, what the Spring Project is really focused on doing is let's set something up that works. Let's set so something up where we start building a microeconomy which grows into several microeconomies, which means we has a lot of people bringing their brilliance where it works. 
And when that's working, we'll find it spreads virally. So very often when you find how to do something that works for you, that's you finding your br brilliance, all you have to do is start doing that, bringing that to the world, and the people around you will start to get, get permission to do the same, and you will find you are changing the world bit by bit. Okay. Would you like to add anything else? Okay. Thank you. So I, I didn't go to any of the sessions, so um, I'm just curious what specific methods or what, what are you doing in the sp spring project? Uh, give us examples so it's more tangible to us. Um, that's, a, that's quite a difficult question. I may hand it over to Andrew because I'm not sure I can answer. But the, re the reason it's difficult is because um, we, Andrew mentioned that we, we are uh, three of us that come from very different backgrounds um, and we're quite experiential. Uh, so I'd say uh, pretty much, you know, high, in the high 90% percent percentage of times that people come to one of our uh, sessions, they find themselves doing stuff they could not have imagined. Um, they didn't anticipate, it's new to them, um, and it's experiential. So, um, you'll find that in, um, if you work around Europe, for example, you find that in different countries they have different cultures. I've done a fair bit of work in France, for example, um, and they quite often like you to tell you what they're going to do before you do it, then you do it, and then they like you to tell you what you've just done. And I always break that by saying, I can't tell you what we're going to do, I'm going to ask you to come on a journey with me. And when we get to the end, we'll talk about it. So I'm going to ask you to suspend disbelief and kind of trust me and go, come with me a bit. Because in five or so steps, it'll, become, it'll start making sense. Now, the, the people who were at the, at the side did that in the last session. <laughs> um, so it's kind of difficult when we say, we're going to do something you've never done before. And I can't describe it until you've done it, because then it'll make sense. And you ask me to tell you about what we're doing. I'm not sure I can answer it. Um, but if you'd like to come and see me afterwards, I'll do something in two minutes, which um, will give you a taste of it. So, I mean, you know, is it, does it involve you know, tapping into your consciousness and mindfulness? Uh, so you're more present and just releasing so, things. I mean, uh, these are kind of meditation. Um, yeah, if you like. We've got like 10, 15 minutes, right? Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, what. If we do, like, one of the quickest things we can do in this circumstance, some of you may have seen this before if you've been here before. Um, so we'll, we'll give you a quick taste. Now, what, what I would say is, when we do this, please don't think that everything's exactly like this. This is just, a, this is just an example of taste. So, um, what I'll ask you to do is to... Uh, I'll have to put the mic under my arm for a minute to, right. oh, to do this. Demonstrate. Okay. So, if you put your f hold your fingers like this. So, interlock your fingers so that you can hold your, your index fingers parallel. Okay. So, now, first of all, if you just bring your fingertips together and look at what they look like when they touch. Feel what they feel like when they touch. And if possible, even hear what it sounds like as they touch. Okay. And then physically hold them parallel. As strong as you can. Hold them parallel physically but look at them and picture them coming together. So with your mind, you're picturing them coming together. You're seeing them come together. You're hearing them come together. You're feeling them come together. You're holding that image of them coming together. But physically, you try and stop it. Mentally, you try and make it happen. What's winning, your mind or your body? So 
So we're getting some smiles and giggles developing. <laughs> so what are you experiencing? What, what, what did you feel? So it, it's, it's your base, your mind is winning. Okay. Uh, I think it's just subconscious. And I, I did one like hypnotherapy session where the guy asked me to do these kind of things. Okay, so I, I've just asked you what you were feeling and you've, yeah. you've begun to interpret. Yes. Now, we often do that and we often filter the words so heavily that we don't actually know what we're experiencing or feeling. When you, when you say to someone, what did you feel? And they say, uh, surprise, um, perplexity, uh, you know, and they go into an intellectual. So I'll ask you again, what did you actually feel when you were doing that? Um, it's a tough question, isn't it? We're really kind of trained not to be aware of what we're feeling. We, we, uh, we begin interpreting straight away and it removes us step after step away from what we're actually feeling. So um, I do sometimes a following and, and leading exercise between people and you get some people crashing into each other and you say, uh, what are you actually feeling? And they say, uh, judgment, um, um, disagreement. You know, no. What you're actually feeling is physical impact, bruising. <laughs> We're actually. What are we actually feeling? It's really difficult to bring ourselves back to that. So I would suggest what you're actually feeling um, might be to do with tension. What, what starts to happen generally is your heart rate goes up. Some different chemicals come into your bloodstream. Um, some of you might have felt your skin beginning to prickle slightly. Basically, your, your stress response is coming in. Um, and the reason is because your mind and body are fighting each other. There's a conflict going on. Now, if you if you'd do the same again, but this time offer no resistance, just... Hold your fingers parallel. Picture coming them, to them coming together. And offer no resistance. What happens? This is a kind of um, way of uh, measuring, in a sense, your integrity or how much your mind and body are in touch with each other. There's a percentage of people who sit there and nothing happens. Um, the more practiced you are at vision and, and at manifesting vision, the quicker those fingers will come together. If I go like this and I see them come together, they come together. Now, if you picture them coming apart, they come apart. So it's a, it's a question of how much are we used to expecting the things we want to do to be difficult? Quite often, we can create amazing outcomes really, really easily. And the reason we make it difficult is be because we've led, been led to believe it's difficult. Quite often, you can do extraordinary things almost without effort. If, in fact, if you watch someone who's really skilled, really top-level sports person doing something impossible, they make it look easy. And that's someone letting their brilliance come out in a, in a very direct way. Okay, does that give you a taste? Great. Thank you. I think we still have time for, for, for one more. Yes, we do. Yep. yep. Maybe, maybe two, if we're... So, how did you create the source code? Yeah, so, so there was a, an element of... Um, Supporting people to have a roadmap, you know, rather than, than it all just being, you know, practice, you know, getting a line, you know, a line. we realized there were words that were consistent, you know, there were words that people could understand, connect to, became easier to explain than others, were, un, you know, were less likely to be misinterpreted as we experimented and as we, so, so what we came up with were essentially you know, as, as pure are the characteristics that if you develop them all, yeah, then that was going to support the process of brilliance coming out. 
And, and, and that's not just, an, an, like Dennis is saying, an intellectual understanding of them. It's a, you know, integrity, a physical development and practice of integrity in your body and your mind. You know, responsibility is like responsibility to your body as much as your, your mind. Curiosity, you know, in every situation, are you really curious? Are you really looking for what you can learn from it? Are you bringing, you know, integrity with your curiosity? Where are you shutting down your curiosity? That's a physical thing as much as a, a kind of intellect, my brain working as well as my body working. So the, the, this source code was simply a kind of an opportunity to provide a roadmap that, that was kind of logical, people could understand it, and gave kind of, kind of spheres for people to practice within. It's like, now I'm practicing integrity. This is what I, you know, what I really want to practice. Now, if you really start to practice them, you'll notice that they all overlap. They're, they're all inter, interrelated. They all support the idea of well-being within yourself. And you know, if you, tr if you try and be super at responsibility and, and ne neglect your integrity, it's difficult to have well-being and brilliance. And so it, actually, although we've, we've broken them out, they actually all, f all form a whole. And it, it's really the simplest and fastest way that we've, we understand to take large groups of people in a short space of time towards their brilliance. So that, that's why we created a, a code. And we also thought a code would be quite nice for this week's event, it being technology orientated. Thank you. One, Do we have any more one, questions? Was, I think there was one more question. Yeah. Has it been answered? OK, <laughs> great. OK. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, I hope it stimulated a little bit of thought. Uh, if, and the Spring Project is all about helping brilliance to, to come about. I hope we've helped a little bit to think about your brilliance, what you're brilliant, about, brilliant at. Um, and yeah, wish you well in the future. If you want to find out more, there's plenty online. Come along to one of our sessions if you're curious about it. And yeah, may you be brilliant in everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you all for being with us. Our next session will be here at 4 o'clock, which will be a presentation and a discussion on education in the digital age. You're all welcome to join us. Thank you.